I think I worked out there's about 20 cameras here on this desk, which is a lot of cameras. But think about the fact that it represents 35 odd years of photography. G'day everybody, how are you going today? Today, I wanna to talk about my favorite camera ever. Now, I don't own every camera I've ever bought, but I still own quite a lot. All the way from here, this Pentax, all the way through to the Z50, which we're shooting on right there as our B camera, and a lot of cameras in between. So what I'm gonna do today is talk about briefly each one of these cameras and why I got it. And please keep in mind, this is a video about over 30 cameras. And even if we talk about each one for one minute, well, that's 30 minutes. But it's an exciting journey through lots of brands, lots of cameras, lots of formats. And check out the bonus material at the end. And I'm going to tell you my favorite ever. There might be more than one, but that's because all cameras are not made equal. And here we have a mixture of largely 35 mil, mostly 35 mil, and a couple of real medium formats. Shall we do this? Let's do it. Here I am in a bed of cameras. There's a lot. I would say probably close to 50% of the cameras I've ever had are on this table and the rest I have sold as I've gone. The reasons I've kept some of these is because they were so useful for so long, cost so much money, and by the time I decided maybe I should sell it, it just literally wasn't worth it and it was just better and more fun to keep it. And some of these I kept for sentimental reasons, but that's the main two reasons really, that uh, once once a camera loses 90% of its value, I, I don't see the point. And these are beautiful things and I love them anyway. So, okay, let's start at the very start. Now I don't have this camera handy. I couldn't find it, I looked hard for it. And it was my dad's 120 film that uh, was from the 1950s. It was a twin lens reflex and you, you looked down into it. That's how it worked. That camera was my very first camera and I think I first used it when I was five, six, seven years old. The next camera that I used after that was a 110 film camera that my parents bought me when I was about 11. A tiny little thin thing. 110 film was tiny, it wasn't good. And then by the time I was 13 or 14, this camera here. And this is the Pentax K1000. This was my first 35 mil camera. I used it at school and I used it to start off my career as a photographer. And this lens here, the gorgeous and famous, everybody's heard of Kiron, right? And this is a, a 28 to 210. 28 to 210, what a weird focal range. Yes, it's a 3.8 to 5.6, 28 to 210 lens. Now, this was my, my, my main camera and my main lens for quite a long time. Until we got, so that was, uh, that was like 1984. Then in 1992, I purchased, I purchased my first camera. This one was from my parents, which was the Pentax SFXN. I do still have that camera, but I actually think it's in the warehouse. I couldn't put my hands on it. I was in the Pentax mount. I had like two lenses. So I decided to stay in the Pentax mount. Now that SFXN served me well from 1992 to 1997 when this beast here, is it this beast? No, um, not a surprise. Let's, ma let's make some space, shall we? Because you can't see me. We, we, we get the effect. There's lot, lots of cameras here. Now I suspect I'm not gonna be able to find any of those cameras now that I've moved them. In the mid nineties, I got this gorgeous, 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 gorgeous device. 
Medium format, everybody raged about medium format. It's the only way, it's the best way. With its detachable backs, see here we can, this is, this is protects the film, which allows you to take the back off. This looks a little bit um, David Copperfield. Maybe Peter McKinnon could tell, tell us something about this, being a magician and all. What an amazing camera this RB67 is. You used to shoot 126 by 7 film on this. I have three of these backs, which basically means you could change from black and white to colour at your will. And this is how we did it in the days of film. And in reality, this is not very long ago that we had to... We only had one card slot, and this is how we achieved variable ISO, all going from black and white to colour. Very, very analog, very, very manual. And in my world, this was the way up until 2003 at professional level cameras. I had this astonishing zoom lens for this device that came out to about here. It was something like a 150 to 300 in medium format terms and the camera store, this is back in like 1995, the, the camera store had this lens but nobody wanted it. It was something like $11,000 and they had it for half price at five and a half and I thought, wow, a medium format lens, that's like a, a unicorn almost anyway. I have to have it. So I have it and I have it somewhere. I'm just not quite sure where. I do hope one day to be able to put a digital back onto this little thing. That would be amazing and, and bring it back to life. If anybody knows about digital backs for these sort of cameras, specifically an RB67 as opposed to the RZ, I think there's a Mamiya RZ. I found it. Okay, it's 1997 and this little beauty came into my life. I actually wanted this. It was too expensive. I bought the F4 secondhand from a secondhand camera dealer here in Melbourne. And then it was like, oh, this one's so much better. And I went back after one day and they let me go from a secondhand F4 to this F5, which I think cost me around $6,000 back in 1997, a lot of money. But have a look at this. If you look at these two cameras, you can see here they, from the front, there's not much to tell them apart. Obviously the numbers do. Nikon has really kept their design similar. There they are. Gorgeous cameras. So we've got the, uh, the F and the D3. Okay, so the F5, glorious camera, shot fast, but obviously, obviously, can I even remember how to open this thing? Oh, oh no, there we go, no, no, no. <laughs> That's the way. So this is how we open it. You lift this thing here and look at that glorious glorious film and it still works it requires eight uh, AA batteries we should take it for a spin sometime I suppose I'll let me know in the comments if you'd like to do that and I'm sad to say in the 50 millimeter um, lens look that I did last week you can watch that film here I forgot that I had this 50 mil lens this is a 50 mil 1.8 and I should have compared it with the Z 50 mil 1.8 let me know if you'd like me to do that just for fun it's just interesting Anyway, well, let me know. So this camera here served me from 1997 all the way through until I bought my first D70. Now I did sell my D70, so I do not have that here to show us, but we all know what a D70 looks like. I do need to add that digital was on the rise and I did buy a couple of, couple of digital cameras. One being the, the first one being this little guy here made by Kodak. 1.7 megapixels, had a CF card. The first one I bought was eight megabytes. What can I tell you? This is, um, <laughs> this was, and this was 19, I think it was 1999. So even so I had the, the best, the best in 35 millimeter in the F5 here. Obviously digital was coming. So I started to play with it. And I had played with it before using the VX1000 to frame grab. But that's not a camera, that's not a stills camera. It was never a stills camera, it was a video camera. After that one, 1999, I bought this little guy here. This is the DC4800. Now the DC4800, it was 3.1 megapixels. And also CF, and I took this camera here, the F5, 
and this camera here in 2001 when I went to Europe, mostly living in Paris for five weeks. One of the most amazing experiences of my life. And this was, this was the transition. This is what the transition looked like to move from film to digital. Obviously with a camera like this, not good enough, but I was starting to experiment. And this thing cost me over $2,000 back in 2001. Very expensive. Next was the D70, three years later. I don't think I bought anything in between. And then after the D70, I got the D2X. Now I don't have the D2X. That was my least favorite camera of all time because it cost so much and it was a cropped sensor. And I was just waiting for Nikon to go full frame because Canon had gone full frame a long time beforehand. Luckily, as I was starting to consider, because it had been years, not months like some people seem to worry about now or a year or two, but it had been years. Finally, Nikon came out with this guy. Well, not specifically this guy, but this guy's younger brother, the D3. They do the flagship release and then they do the little speed bump after that, two years later. So for a couple of years there, I had a D3 and a D3S. But I also loved another camera called the D700, which I also had one of those. Basically, the D, I had the D700 before I had the D3S. The D700 and the D3 were basically the same chip, and basically the D700 was the precursor to the D800. Notice the name. It was basically a professional level camera, but in the smaller style, non-vertical grip body. So I had a D3 and a D700, back to back, same photos, same amazing 12 megapixel sensor, absolutely loved it. And then I went for this guy here, the D3S. It had slightly increased specs, not really sure why I went for two of them. I think I was maybe doing a lot of weddings and so on at that time, and these were just absolutely cracker war, workhorse, bulletproof cameras for that sort of thing. And this is where in Oh, still a card in there. But this is uh, when we first saw dual card slots. Yeah, a relatively new thing. And then after this came cracker of a beast. This is the D4, 16 megapixels. I don't know, 14 frames a second or something like that. You, you, could, you could drive a tank over this and it simply wouldn't care. It'd just stand up and keep going. This was in 2012. I got this camera, 2012, and in the same year, the D800 and the D800E came out. 36 megapixels, one without an anti-alias filter. High resolution, the E variant. So I ended up having this for speed and uh, just, well, basically for speed and robustness. Obviously the vertical grip. There was, a, we were kind of in a weird time where from 2012 onwards, there was a divergence between ultimate toughness and high speed versus megapixels. And what they did with the D800 slash D800E, they created a high megapixel monster at 36 megapixels. And with this monster, it was only 16 megapixels, but bulletproof, vertical grip, ridiculously long life battery. And, uh, but it was a clear divergence, which we're still seeing today. This camera I've pretty much stopped using and maybe only bring it out on very rare occasions. After, after that, there, as I said, I got the D800E, of which I got two D800Es. At this point in time, I was always having two bodies. That was just a, just like people say you need two card slots. Well, I think it's even more important to have two bodies. At least if a card dies, you can just slap in another one. But if a body dies and you don't have another one, the shoot is over and that is not good. Probably 2005, I had the D2X and the D70 dual bodies. From then on, that's when I was dual bodies, even so there was only single slots in that period of time. After the D4, like I said, there was the D800E. As much as a lot of people talk about the fact that Nikon were late to mirrorless and detachable lens mirrorless, it's not exactly true. This camera here, the V1, which I purchased in 2012, I got it in Hong Kong when I was making my first book and I traveled through Hong Kong on my way to China and I decided I wanted to experiment with the idea of mirrorless compact cameras. This is a common theme. I was just trying to keep everything small and what was so exciting about this camera was that you could 
Adapt F glass onto it, which I got the adapter and I have done. Let me know if you'd like me to make a film about it. It still works. And I'll show you with something really interesting. 2012, they even stuck the same battery in there that we use in the current Z6 and Z7 cameras. Amazing. And the Z5, of course, now. Same form factor all the way back in 2012. What, what let this camera down was the sensor size. Absolutely tiny. And for me, in the end, it was just too small. It was too small and I couldn't, it, it basically couldn't match obviously a D4 or a D800. So it was a short-lived experiment, that one. But an exciting camera, 2012. And then in 2013, this little guy here arrived, the A7R. This was quenching my hunger for a small yet full frame. Finally, we had a full frame sensor in a mirrorless body. This was what I'd been waiting for for years. And here it was with detachable lenses. I got this camera. I tried with it, I tried hard with it. I bought about three lenses. They ha only had about three lenses on la launch and I got all of those and I worked with it. And this allegedly had the same sensor, the same 36 megapixel sensor in it as the D800. And what I found was, is the sensor may well have been the same, but the moment I dived into the shadows to try and pull information out of it, it wasn't there. And what Sony had decided to do in their infinite wisdom was compress the shadows and throw away the data. But ultimately this meant I couldn't go out shooting as I often did with two or even three bodies and expect the same results from each camera. So I couldn't use it. And that's what put Sony back on the shelf for me. And then after the D800E, there was the D810. Now I sold my D800Es and I also sold both of my D810s. And after the D810s came the D850s. 2017, these little guys came out and the reality is the world considered them the best DSLRs ever made, the best all-round DSLR. You, with the, uh, with the vertical grip, I think you're shooting something like 10 frames a second at 45, almost 46 megapixels. So from a DSLR perspective, this is where I was at mid-2017. I was starting to think about YouTube and I was starting to think I wanted a hybrid camera that did good video. And I tried with the D850, but I simply couldn't do something like what I'm doing right now, which is to film myself and rely on the autofocus. This camera here, this camera here is the one that I bought. This is the Sony A7R III. After a lot of thinking and playing and looking at the options in the world, I, uh, I, I ultimately considered that this was the one to go with. I looked at Canon, Panaso the Panasonic GH5, Fuji's. I, I basically looked at every possible option. And basically because this sensor size was a 42 megapixel sensor, very close to the, the D850s in the 45, I thought that would fit into my world really well. And at the time of buying this, the, the Nikon Z cameras were still rumored to be a year and a half away. So it was like, oh, I just, I just can't wait that long. So I will get this specifically for YouTubing and having in my back pocket all the time. And look, it's a great camera, but it still had a lot of the issues that I had with the original A7R III, the A, sorry, the A7R, which was things like ergonomics and button layout and stuff like that. It, it just it just wasn't as seamless and as easy to use. Anyway, this is not a anti-Sony video. This is just the reason why I made my next step, which was, lo and behold, Nikon did announce the Z cameras about six weeks after I bought the A7R III, which was pretty annoying. And that took us to this beauty here. And that is the Z7. What a great camera. Basically had the same sensor in, in it as the D850, which just makes it a seamless fit into my D850 world. And what Nikon did here is allowed users like me who were working very happily with their D850s, but wanted a better quality video camera, wanted the Nikon experience, didn't necessarily want to pay for a D5, D6 level price point for us to slide into the system and start experimenting. And this is what 
this is what happened. I bought this camera and I quickly learned how much I loved it. I started to slowly invest in the lenses, the prime lenses, all kind of around either side of $1,000 Australian here. It meant that I could every two or three or four months buy another lens and just gently get to know what the system felt like. So that was the next camera after that. And then came the Z6, which we are shooting on right now. There it is right there. Basically looks identical, absolutely identical to this one right here. Just has a Z6 on the front instead of a Z7. And then the next was the Z50, which we're shooting on right there, which I basically, as, as I got to know the Z system and more and more uh, dove into it, it just, it just proved to be spectacular. The lens is spectacular and affordable. The Z6 I got as a dedicated, basically video camera doing what we're doing right now. It's been doing it for about a year for me. And then the Z50 I got as a B-roll camera to do exactly what it's doing right there. So it's all working exactly as planned, which is absolutely fabulous. And this is where we're up to. And the next question is going to be Z5 as a studio camera, a second studio full frame, because I do prefer the full frame, although the 4, 4K is cropped on the Z5. So that kind of mitigates that for me. Or I just wait and see what's installed with the Z. 6s and the z7s bit of a conundrum maybe i should have just gotten two z6s they have been and continue to be very very much on sale that may be the direction i go in although the z6s with potentially 60 frames per second 4k is going to be interesting so that's what the future holds i think i worked out there's about 20 cameras here on this desk which is a lot of cameras but think about the fact that it represents 35 odd years of photography there's probably a, a, a about 10 years of 10, 10 cameras missing here because i've sold them so it may well be 35 odd cameras for 35 years which is a camera a year and as a professional photographer investing anywhere between one and five thousand dollars relative to annual income is a drop in the ocean so it is normal for photographers to have well, me anyway, <laughs> to have this level, these this many cameras. It's like it's like basically a a carpenter or whatever. You've just simply got to have the best tools that get the job done most efficiently and work best for you in your use case. That's what it's all about. And some of these things are experiments, of course. I didn't talk about these two cameras yet, but these are GoPros. This is the GoPro 4. I even bought the original GoPro, which I don't really know where that is right now. And I got these as experiments, filmmaking experiments, because I've always been a filmmaker at the same time as being a photographer. I've, I, I actually wanted to be a filmmaker. I went to uh, media school. I got into photography school and general media, and I chose the general media. So filmmaking's always been on the side. It's always been there. That's why I have cameras like the VX1000 as well. And I've made um, TV ads, music videos, uh, plenty of documentaries and training films over the last 30 years as a bit of a side job to my photography job. Um, yeah, in, in the 90s, I was a camera operator using ARRI SR2 16mm film cameras. So I was a camera operator, camera assistant, and even a DOP on, on the odd occasion as well. And that was in the mid 90s. So yeah, this stuff is very much in my blood. Cameras, photography, moving pictures. I absolutely love it. So from all of this, I wanted to share with you my favorite camera from my collection of all time. Now this is pretty difficult and it's not gonna be one. It's going to be a couple. This is the Pentax K1000, my first ever 35 mil camera. And honestly, that thing was a workhorse for the first, I don't know, five or six years of my photography. It has captured some of my most important early images, fully manual, fully everything manual, and hardly require, the battery you change about once every three years. It's one of those tiny little button batteries. That's camera number one. Camera number two, this guy, this guy right here, camera number two, most important camera in my life. It is the 
Nikon D3. Now, I don't have my D3 anymore, but this is the D3S, absolutely considered to me to be a benchmark camera, which really changed what I was able to achieve artistically. The D2X couldn't go very efficiently into the above, say, 400 ISO, and this could shoot at 16 and 3200, and it just, it just changed the opportunities that were available for me as a landscape, streetscape and working photographer. You could just do things you simply couldn't do before. And getting back to full frame after having been out of full frame for four or five years with the D70 and the D2X, this was just an absolutely sublime moment. Also at this time, it is absolutely essential to mention that Nikon upgraded their color science significantly, which is what they're famous for now. And somehow they created in the D3 a sensor that looked and felt much more like traditional film. This was a big step. So that's camera, favourite camera of all time, number two. The absolutely beautiful and glorious Hasselblad. Here it is right here. This camera I got in 2016. I purchased it second hand and still over $20,000 second hand. A ridiculous camera. New, I think in this country, around $50,000. This is a real medium format sized sensor and back. And if we were to put it side by side, Z7, you just get an idea of the, the difference in sizes there. I, I purchased this camera because I've always been interested in medium format, as we saw with the RB67. So 20 years later, I went with a digital medium format. Now this is a 60 megapixel sensor. Its uh, sensor is about uh, area wise 50% larger than the GFX 100. It's big and that means the photo sites each individual pixel is significantly larger and not only that but it shoots in 16 bit. There's lots that many would not like about this camera. It weighs a ton. It shoots 1.5 frames per second. Its focus is slow, not great. It only has one card slot and it's CF, good old fashioned CF. And I think it has a maximum card capability of 32 gigabytes. So this has so many compromises, so many compromises. So why bother with it? Because optically, image quality wise, 16 bit, large photo sites, the images are the absolute dream. And honestly, the, the images from this camera don't have very much to do with the images from any of the other cameras you've seen here today. Just optically medium format is a whole different ball game. The way light is processed through a lens onto a much larger sensor is very different to how light, light travels with 35 mil or smaller. This is a divine camera and I would like to get it out and about more often. But I've taken some images with this camera that have ended up on canvas that I've printed myself, which is 2.8 meters, almost three meters by one and a half meters, which means 60 inches on the short side and almost double that. That's 120 inches on the long side. And these canvases, you cannot make out the pixels even if you get up close. Uh, ridiculous, if that's important to you. And of course, we all have different use cases and I've been selling large canvases like that since 2008 when I bought my first 64 inch Epson printer. So I've had a real world usage for a camera like this for 12 years and uh, it's a dream to have it. But I don't think I'll spend much more money on this camera because its technology is now aging and I think there's well there's the GFX 100 which I love and I do think it's possible that Nikon could make a GFX 100 sized sensor and either some of the glass we already have would work with it or Nikon could make some slightly larger glass and let's say that slightly larger glass is um, something like 20% larger something 20 25% larger even if the price was double if I could get a 50 mil prime for $2,000 instead of $1,000 and so on. I would buy that camera and one of those primes if they released a set of five primes over the space of three years for that small medium format. I would be 100% there because I love what the Z7 is doing on that front. So this is one of my favorite cameras of all time simply because from all this other equipment that's here, it is optically untouchable. Frame rates, heaps of other metrics 
it fails. But I'm a photographer who likes to make beautiful images that people put on their walls and keep for 10 years. Strangely, as a quick aside, I delivered a book locally to a house here uh, just last week and they had bought one of my images back in 2006 and I delivered it, the book, because it was local and I, I like to have a good excuse to get out of the house during lockdown. And they'd had that picture on that wall since 2006, so it had been there for 14 years. And this, this device here allows me to create images which are stunning. I'm not capturing birds, I'm not capturing motorbikes coming at me at 100 miles an hour. Irrelevant to me. And then the final camera to fit that category is this camera here. This is the Nikon Z7. The Nikon Z7. Now, I love this camera because sensor-wise, it's a D850. Hybrid-wise, it allows me to do what we're doing right now, shoot video and be confident. It's small and it's a Z. So it comes with all of this whole new breed of glass of which it's a good step, if not more than a good step, above the equivalent glass in the F mount. There's no question to me this is the future. It's not saying, that by way of that I'm not saying the F doesn't continue to have a future, but this is the long-term future. This mount also has allowed me to adapt other glass, like Sony glass with the TechArt adapter. It's just a complete system it works really well. I can still use all of my old glass and all of my old accessories, batteries, flashes, all of that stuff. It just seems to me such a sweet spot and to have so much power, so much familiarity, so much optical performance in this tiny little package. And basically it's very adaptable. It's adaptable back to the F mount Basically, almost every single lens I own will go on this. I mean, for example, I found this lens here. Now this is, I thought I'd sold this lens. This is my 18 to 200. And uh, with the F to Z adapter, it will mount and it will work. This is electronic. It is not screw driven. This is an extraordinarily adaptable system. Really anybody could get into this and you can adapt Leica glass, you can adapt Canon glass, Sony glass, F glass. You can decide to travel compact and put a little lens on it. We're gonna have pancake lenses coming out with it soon. This is just such a complete all rounder. It just covers so much history, so many situations. It's just really exciting that you can just, almost anything you can think to do with it, you can do with it. And right now, there's only a very small bunch of users, wildlife and high action sports. And when I say wildlife, I don't mean a bear who's sitting clawing at a tree. I mean a falcon that's flying straight at you. It'll, and look, the reality is you can jump online and you can see people capturing those shots. So it does do that. This really is an astonishing all-rounder. Up there, similar to the D850. The D850 is obviously better when it comes to focus. But this is better when it comes to so many other things, like adapting all those different types of lenses, like being a better hybrid video camera, like being small, and like having access to all that amazing Z glass. The Z7, honestly. And with the rumored Z7S to come soon, this story only gets better very soon. So my favorite camera of all time, standing right next to the Hasselblad, which we just saw, is the Nikon Z7. This camera amazes me. I love it. It does it does so many different things. Like uh, like it can do raw video. D850 can't do raw video. Amazing. Anyway, this has been a very long journey and I've actually, whilst going through this journey, realized I've actually missed a couple of cameras because there has been so many. Like between my Pentax K1000 and my Pentax SFXN, there was a P30, a Pentax P30, that I think came into my life around the time I turned 18. So many cameras that have informed my journey as a, uh, an artist and as a professional, and I'm so happy with where it's led me. I would love to hear your journey. How many cameras do you think you've had your entire life. Some people out there that watch this channel have been doing this for 50 years. They might've had a couple and some people I'm sure have only been doing it for five and it's okay if you've only had one. That's fine too. Please share it with me. I'd love you to share it with me. As always, everybody, it has been so lovely to see you. If this is your first time here, welcome. I'd love to see you again. Please subscribe, please share, 
please like, and if you'd like to see over 200 episodes right now, you can, you can just click on the Meadow and Photography down there. But this here, this is it. This is my top three cameras from my collection of all time. The Z7, the Hasselblad H4D, and the Nikon D3. These are the cameras that really made a profound difference and were a step, a major step, not just an iterative one, a major step when I got hold of this camera gear. How exciting. Thank you, everybody. I'll see you soon. So the Mamiya, R, the RB, uh, I, I had an even harder look for that zoom lens, still can't find it, but here's some of the other lenses that I had for it. Um, that's one, and that's another. So I had four lenses in total for this beauty. And um, if anybody's got any ideas, if, 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 if you know of anyone who makes a digital back for an RB67, I think they make them for the RZ, but I'm not sure about the RB67. I'd be really interested in it. Anyway, there's Two, there's the, you're seeing three of the four lenses that I have. So what I was trying to do between 2007 and 2013 when I got the A7R was work with these compact cameras here. They had the ability to be completely manual, had reasonable sized sensors in them. I suppose the downside was as the lenses were fixed, but they were small. You could fit them in a pocket. And I was trying to find a solution to not have to carry this sort of thing around with me all the time. And we have the S90 here and then the camera I got after that. But this was the first one that I got. This was the S80 in 2006. I got this. And, and just as proof that the camera is not what makes the image. One of my most popular images of all time this image right here, Pulp Fiction, was photographed on the Canon S80 8 megapixel pocket camera. And this has been a massive image for me since 2006. Obviously, on the cover of one of my books. My foray into this, it worked and it yielded me some fabulous outcomes. And this little camera here, this was a, a foray into what would be a good pocket camera? This is before I got the um, A7R 3 and the Z7. What could I use as a vlogging camera? And this camera is kind of Casey Neistat's fault. He recommended this to me, but 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 sound was an issue with this camera. You, there was no sound input, which is a bit silly. This is the RX version 5, of which they've improved on a couple of times since. And now the camera that I probably would have liked this to have been is now out. But again, experimentation kind of worked, but ultimately didn't work well enough. The quality wasn't there was really my issue with it, even so it had a one inch sensor.